I'm Susan Smith and welcome to Stitched by Susan live streaming in my studio. We're working on a quilt of valor today. So let's hear the intro and get started. Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Smith. Hello, hello, my quilting friends. I'm coming to you from the Pacific Inland Northwest. And today we're having a broken cloudy slash sunny day. So if the lighting kind of ebbs and flows in my studio, that is why it's live. So today we're working on a quilt of valor. I know lots of you will be familiar with that program or outreach, but in case you're not in North America, and it looks a little bit different in Canada. So maybe I should just speak to the United States. We have this huge charitable organization that makes quilts for veterans of any armed force. And so chapters in different cities with a little bit different focuses, but in general, they all create red, white, and blue quilts, very patriotic quilts. And these are finished then and given to veterans of any age and having served anywhere in the military. So it's a really awesome form of outreach. And the way that these quilts kind of work, they sort of pass down a production line. So someone I'm sure does the planning and shopping, but then someone does the cutting and the piecing. Someone else assembles, you know, the batting and the backing. Then it goes to a long armor like myself. There are many others I know in our city who do this as well. And from there, it will get sent to someone who will put the binding on it. And finally, it will get delivered to its recipient. So through that process, there's a little paper that goes with it with the pertinent details and you know who's been working on it and how to contact them and so forth. So for today's quilt, um, in my lead up to today in my prep, I was cutting the, the batting and so forth and, and checking on that paper. Here's the size of the quilt and here's the size of the backing. And I kind of took their word for it. Well, this morning, just a few minutes before we were set to go live, I was laying it all out on the floor and I kind of fold things you know, in order so I can grab them quickly. And I realized that the backing actually was shorter than the quilt. So we had a little delay of our, of our going live this morning as I quickly scrambled to my sewing machine and attached a leader to the backing, which you'll see. So there will be an extra topic today, how to extend your backing when it's not quite long enough. And I actually had to trim a little bit off the top and bottom edges of the quilt because the backing fabric was about an inch shorter than the quilt as a whole. So that all said though, I want to talk today about a few topics that I think are really common among long arm quilters. Choosing thread when you've got a quilt that has high contrast fabric, so the red, the white, and the blue. What color do you quilt that with? Um, and then some good design choices for quilts of valor, which typically the mandate is not to do anything too, too, too fussy, right? You don't want one quilt standing out head and shoulders above the rest, right? One quilt's got 40 hours of quilting in it and someone else's just has 30 minutes, right? So they try to keep a standard of of comfort level and beauty and washability and softness among all the quilts. So I'm trying to think of all of that as I choose a quilting design for this project. So I think, um, let's talk about a few more things I offer before I start loading though, just in case you don't know these already. Um, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel if you're enjoying this show, if you like this behind the scenes, very live, very unscripted um, show that we produce. And take a moment if you want to, to share it with your friends. It'll be three or four minutes till we actually get into the quilt yet. So there's still time for that. And if you click on the bell button as well, you'll receive notifications when I am going live. I do try and send out a newsletter a couple of days before each live, giving a photograph of what I'll be working on and some of the topics that are included so that you can decide if they're of interest to you this week. So if you have not yet signed up for my newsletter, you can do that super easily by going to my website, stitchedbysusan.com and you'll get a little pop-up. You know the drill, you see those all the time on websites. Um, I'm often offering a little freebie there, so if you choose the freebie, you will just get added to the newsletter as well. In addition, um, this channel is kind of a, um, well, unscripted, a very candid look into my quilting style. Um, and it all kind of leads up to the kind of quilting that I love to teach, which is the idea of quilting freehand and quilting edge to edge and how beautiful that can be on quilts. Custom quilting is not necessary to create a beautiful quilt. And to that end, I have two learning resources that are available for you. One is a master class, which is huge and comprehensive and teaches over 30 freehand designs. Step by step gives you doodle sheets and support as you go through it and all those things. 
And then the other is a monthly membership, which I call Advance. And that's for people who either A, have been through my masterclass or B, have some quilting under their belt, but they want to advance. They want to move further. So they want more freehand designs or they want more quilting tips or they want to see input from other teachers and some other styles and some custom quilting techniques and they just want more want to advance. So both those things can be found on my website too. There is a classes tab and they're both under there. If you want more information, there's informational um, pages there. You can learn all about them. Uh, what else? Podcast. Just released an episode this week um, with my friend Sam Alberts, who lives just over the border in British Columbia, Canada. Sam was a guest on episode number four about two years ago and came back again to kind of update us on her business. She's been growing her quilting business. And of course, in those two years, many, many, many things have happened, right, in our local economy. So how did she do that in a time when it was very challenging to grow a business? So Sam is always entertaining and fun. That episode is live and you can always find the podcast at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And it was kind of fitting to have Sam on because last week, the first week of February, the podcast actually ranked number one in Canada crafts, which I was just so proud of, truly. To me, it feels like just a little podcast. I'm just dabbling. And to be ranked number one anywhere for anything was quite amazing. And then lastly, if you're interested in supporting this show, you can do that super easily by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. There for as little as $5, you can make a contribution. You can do it one time. You can sign up to do it monthly. And every dollar that comes from that, we invest in bettering our equipment, better cameras, better routers, better hubs, better memory storage, whatever the thing is. I don't even know all that stuff. But that's what that whole fund goes for. And then finally, let me give credits to those who have helped me put on this show. You heard our son, Will, in the introduction. He does a few of these and he's in his different voices. Um, my husband, Dave, who is behind the scenes. You can see him behind the desk. You can't see all the spaghetti wires. We'll have to get a picture of that for you guys. I'm so grateful because this is a production I absolutely could not do on my own. So I'm so grateful that Dave takes over that technical part of it. And our good friend Dan, who provides the guitar music that you hear throughout. And I'm sorry, his album is not available commercially, but he has graciously allowed us to use it. So you have to watch the show to hear Dan's music. Okay, have I caught everything, Mr. Producer? I think so. I have one comment I need to read. Whew. Okay, apparently there's a comment I need to read, and then we're going to get started loading. Let's see. Linda, sorry, I get great ideas from you usable on my midarm. Hubby hopes you don't push me into buying a long arm. Okay, I'll try not to. This is not intended to be a sales pitch for a long arm. It's just showing you mine. So one of the discussion points that's been happening over the last few weeks, uh, someone alluded earlier, I have recently changed long arm brands. So I am now driving a Bernina Q24 and the loading is just a little bit different. The way the bars and rollers are arranged is a little bit different. So for the last few episodes, I haven't shown my loading process as I try this way and try that way. So today I'm gonna to show the whole thing. This may change again in future, but this is what's working for me now. And I will preface it by saying, it's not necessarily, it's not Bernina's um, official way to do it. I'm interested in efficiency because I do quite a high number of quilts because they're not usually custom quilts. And so I'm interested in efficiency in my quilting. So I'm looking for the quickest way to load it up. So among other things, this rail that's right in front of me is intended to have the backing on it. Sorry, just a second. Okay, there you go. Now you can see it a little better. This roll right here is intended to be rolling up my backing fabric right on the top here. So when you roll it, you know, scroll up that fabric, you end up getting multiple layers of fabric on this bar. I opted not to do that. As you'll see later, I use um, um, magnetic bars for stabilizing the front of my quilt. And of course they won't hold as well through multiple layers of fabric. So I opted to, this leader is just coming over this bar, but actually extends to my lower bar. And that's actually where my backing is rolled up. So that's just my personal choice. I'm able to do that because I float my tops, which you'll see in a few minutes as well. So let's get started loading and then we'll talk more about that. Here, this lovely piece of green fabric 
is my ugly strip that I keep on hand just for these purposes when I need to extend a quilt. So I have just run a basting stitch across the edge of my backing so that I've got a little excess fabric to use for attaching to my leaders. And that way I can use every possible inch of my actual backing fabric. Now, because I take it on and off, it's got a kind of stretched out edge and it's not perfectly straight. So I'm actually gonna swivel this so I have a straight edge facing me and I'll have that leader going off on the other end where the excess won't matter. It's got a long tail on it. You'll see as I go along, that doesn't matter a whole lot. So let's get Stella out of the way. Did I introduce Stella properly? My long arm's name is Stella. So many of you ask, you know, why did I change long arms? What was the reasoning behind that? Um, in my last Live and Unscripted, I did a little talking about that. And Dave's going to try and capture that clip and load it as its own episode so that if you want to hear that, if that interests you, you can do that without having to search for it in a multi-hour episode. So I'm using the Red Snapper system, which just means I've got a plastic rod inside the hem of the leader right here. And now I've got a clamp that I'm just clamping down over top of that, which pinches my fabric into place. So what's important is that I have a straight edge on this edge of the quilt and that I line it up evenly because I'm establishing the straightness, the squareness of my quilt right here. So this happens to be a selvage edge on the backing, so I know that it is straight. And the fascinating thing in using this system of loading is I do not have to have a straight edge on the other side. So where I've sewn on that funky extender, if it's not perfectly straight, it's not going to really matter. And you'll see that as I go along. So I'm just clamping this all the way along my rail. And a couple little tiny ones at the end. And now I'm just going to extend my backing right over the rail. And do you know what? I should talk about this for just a second first. Pull it back. Come back here. With my long tail. Okay. Let me show you this. This is my take-up bar right here. And down below it, which is holding the bottom of this, I've got a leveler or a dead bar on, on my side. My quilt is going to roll under that and then roll up onto this bar. So I've just pulled the leader and extended it and flipped it over the top. You will see how that works, but that's how I prepped this leader for loading. I just need to make sure that it is in fact smooth. Okay, and here comes the backing again, green tail and all. So it is important that I pull this backing over straight and smooth. And I don't know what angle Mr. Producer will show you, possibly the back of my head. But it's important that I don't have this um, leaning off to one side or the other. So I can gauge that by looking on my level area that's exposed. And if it's got wrinkles that are running slantwise, I can turn those, and actually, I have an idea, you guys. This just came to me. Learning my machine, right? Here is one of the features of this machine. And I just have to move my cart of tools out of the way. I can actually flip my front roller. Will that help or not? I think it will. If I make this one higher, you can see how this is more level because what's going to happen is as I roll my backing, it's pulling here and I'm using that almost friction of the leader being under there. Let's start rolling and you'll see it to keep it perfectly smooth so that I don't have to um, have a square edge, right? Because it's just being smoothed out as it goes. I've got to move that back a little bit. There we go. Okay, now you'll see it start happening. So as my quilt pulls across here, because of that leader fabric, 
there's just a little bit of friction and that's what helps this whole thing to load smoothly and with no wonkiness. But it's important that I have it going straight, that it's not leaning to the left or the right. Making sense, right? And so I'm going to keep an eye along this top as I'm rolling to make sure there's no creases forming, no wonkiness happening. As you can see, I do have some seams going on. So I just have to keep a weather eye on all of that. And we're just going to roll it up. One advantage of this too, uh, you can't see this one on your camera. You can see it here. I can see the edge of my fabric right here and I can be gauging as well if it's going on straight. Assuming that that edge is cut straight and it isn't always, um, you know, I can watch that too as it's rolling up. So there's any number of ways that I can be heading off problems at the pass, so to speak. But this is just the quickest way of loading ever. And you can see me smoothing out as I get these wrinkles in the center here. I'm smoothing it out, making sure it's feeding on smoothly. No matter how long I spend doing that, believe me, it's faster than trying to square up the whole top or the whole backing before I put it on. And you guys, this truly is live and unscripted. I see that my leader, um, as I was basting it on, it's kind of pulled. It's not as flat and smooth as I would have liked. You'll see that too in a moment. And I'm just going to deal with it as best I can. There it comes. So I'm watching for that leader or that edge to be coming close to the edge of my leader. And at that point, I will stop rolling and come to the other side. Do, 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 do. It's so funny. You get these automatic movements, right? That you're used to on one machine and it requires a little bit of relearning. So I often flip my levers the wrong way and it just takes getting used to. And I did pull it a little too far, didn't I? Okay. Backing up. Backing up. Mr. Producer says, did we mention live and unscripted? Yes, we did. Apparently someone's asking again what I have on my thread cone. So funny. I have a super high tech thread net. It is a lonely Puma sock. You might even see the Puma word on it. And I've cut the toe and cut the heel off and slipped that over top of my sock. You can of course purchase re actual thread nets. Um, the one that came with my machine, I found to be kind of too lightweight. So when I got sewing at any speed, it would just follow the thread up and fly off the, the cone and was no help to me at all. So I went back to my old favorite. So you guys can see now there's this kind of ripply edge along the front. And I am just going to deal with that as best I can by stretching it out. I've only got a basting stitch in there, so that will be fairly easy to do. I'm just clapping a little magnet on there to hold that end in place. And now, not sure if you guys are able to see me. Yeah, you are. See my green tail of my extender? I'm not even going to worry about that. I'm just going to let it hang off the end. And as I start to roll my quilt, I will tuck it up in there so it doesn't get tangled. But I don't need to cut it off. Truly, this piece of green fabric has extended many, many, many quilts. It's the most useful, ugly piece of fabric I have. And usually, I am able to just put these clamps on as it lies. Today, I'm kind of fiddling with it because, as I mentioned, my basting stitch kind of pulled up, almost gathered. And because I was in a hurry, I did not redo it. So I'm just using, honestly, my knowledge of fabric and its flexibility and my experience to, to get this where I think it ought to be. And there's no real science to it. You guys. Okay. <laughs> Roxanne. You're a lifesaver. Someone's asking, am I under the dead bar? And I'm not in all this kerfuffle. 
Okay, let's back up. How many times have we mentioned live and unscripted already? Is it time to take a break and answer some questions? Okay, let me think just a minute without talking. No, I am right. Roxanne, I've pulled that all off and I, and I am right and you'll see it in a moment when I unwind it. That's the purpose of flipping over it. Because my canvas... Yes, no, I'm right. Okay, backing up again. Oh my word. I don't know if we've ever been so candid, Dave, have we? Perhaps we have. There was the time I ran out of backing without realizing my backing was too short, right? And actually ran out on camera. There was that time. Someone is chiming in that they learn so much by watching. You know, there's real value in learning what not to do, isn't there? I have to. These are a few things that I've learned by fiddling with my machine. I have to have a chunk of this leader hanging over. If I just have a little bit and I pull my fabric all the way up, the fabric just goes and falls over the side. Right? So that is one thing I have learned about my machine. I'm seriously thinking, you guys, about doing a little series called Know Your Machine. Just about, like, tricks for loading the bobbin or things like this that just all have to do with the angles of the machine and the way the bars are arranged. And it's different by brand and sometimes different by machine because they seem to have personalities, don't they? Okay. This time we're doing it for reals. My little magnet is holding over there. Do you see how I'm just tossing that little magnet just to hold that in so it doesn't pull over? I keep it there just for that reason. Okay, let's try this again. You guys must be making good comments because Mr. Producer is just snickering behind me. I'm probably missing out on the fun. But I will get my quilt loaded, I promise you. So I, I know again from having looked at this backing, you guys perhaps can't see it on camera, but I know that this edge is also a selvage, so that is actually helping me because my, my wonky green seam is pulling it a bit askew. But because I know that edge is straight, I'm causing this seam to just run right along the top. And if it's not, I'm giving it a tug to put it right across the top because I know that's a straight edge, right? So I'm going to use that knowledge. Um, know my fabric, you know, know the fact that this is a straight edge and... Um, You'll see when I go ahead and roll it up, hopefully you'll see that it will in fact, in fact be straight and smooth, even though I'm manipulating this edge quite a bit. Let me just get a little bit of adjustment going on here. If you don't believe me that this way of loading is fast, and who would believe me after today, um, you might want to watch another episode. <laughs> in which it all works smoothly. Alrighty. Now, watch the magic. That's right, it's gonna make a big thump. And of course I have my pretty green tail, just holding things up. So that was the beauty of having this leader under the dead bar and over, it now falls into place. And I will go ahead and let this roll down. And that's something clearly I need to work out the smoothness of. I don't quite know where it's at or how much excess I need. That's something I will work on with repeated quilts. We are loaded, people. And I am going to take a little extra care today. Um, maybe I'll back this up a bit so you can see. My puckered seam, 
I see that it's there, right? And I'm aware. And because I'm aware of it, I think I can manage it. I can put tension on it where I need to. It's not perfect. Still can't see it. Hang on. There we go. Should be able to see it now, I hope. So what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and get my batting and quilt on here and prepped. And once I get it basted, then I'm going to put some extra tension on right where this seam is just to snug that out a little bit and it will be fine. So my big tail now, I'm just laying across the leader above the quilt, mostly flat. And that's just going to roll up right inside the quilt. I like to keep it long because then it's long enough for any quilt that I have to do this to. I don't have to cut a new one each time. And I just based it on with the biggest stitch that my sewing machine has. That's how I attached it. Alrighty, let's get on to the batting. Do we have any questions that had to do with that very, very, very unwieldy process? While I get my backing laid on. Still waiting for the questions on the screen there. Nancy, love the red solo cup edition too. You noticed, Nancy. So Dave happened to be over at a friend's house the other day and he had his beverages served in red solo cups. And Dave brought me one. Yes, my red solo cup, in case you don't know, is my thread receptacle for thread snips. And at this moment, because I wasn't sure how I'd like it, it's just on there with a piece of double-sided tape. Eventually, I might actually glue it up there. Or put a command hook on or something like that. Okay, Joan, would you push my husband into buying me a lawn? <laughs> Problem is I need a room, which would mean a new house, which would eventually mean a new husband. Never mind. <laughs> Good one, Joan. Oh, dear. Yeah, he's too valuable, irreplaceable. Yep, got it. Juliana, when I use the red snapper, the inside part wiggles around in the leader. Did you sew your leader so the inside part doesn't move as much? Great question. Um, mine fits fairly snugly in that hem. I mean, there is movement. I can make it slide back and forth, but it doesn't wiggle on me. So you might take that seam in just a little bit, make that hem just a little slimmer and try that. Claudia, do you have extra wide leaders to load this way? Claudia, I just have the leaders that came with my machine. The only extension I've got is the zippered leader, which is about two more inches. So I don't know a full answer to that. And of course, there are different styles of frames as well. I do have the pro frame. I'm not sure what the studio frame comes with. Beverly, why are there two cone holders? Um, one is for the bobbin. The one on the other side is used for winding the bobbin because we've got an onboard um, bobbin winder on the Berninas. That's what that's for. Sadie, should the backing fabric be washed and pressed first? Do you know, I think it probably is pre-washed, judging by the feel of it. Um, for pressing... You know, that's a step I kind of skipped over in the chaos of loading. Usually what I do is as it's extended over my machine and hanging down the other side, I just take a water spritzer and all over it. And that relaxes the wrinkles enough. I didn't see any hard creases in it. So it's going to be fine. As I quilt, I'm always going to have some tension on it a little bit. So I don't think we're going to have any trouble with that. Uh, Joan, again, how short was the backing? It seems that would only add an inch or two to available backing fabric. Do you know, it probably does only add about two inches, Joan, and we may find when I come to the end that I'm still very, very, very close, but it allows me to use almost every inch of the actual backing, right? Because I only took a scant quarter inch in my basting seam, and I'm going to put my quilt right up next to that. So instead of the inch and a half that my red snapper would take up, right, that's all done with the green now. And like I said, I did have to trim a little bit off the quilt. I took about three quarters of an inch off top and bottom. Okay, Kim, love watching you put the red snappers on. Mine are new and very tight. Thinking of putting them in a hot bath. Absolutely, Kim. And I've even, when mine early on, I actually took a hot blow dryer to them, like as I was working and warmed them up. And that helps too. They do get looser. So know that, that will it will get better. Madge, depending on the quilt top pattern, have you ever had to add a header to the top and bottom to align with the backing and provide extra room to stitch to the bottom of the quilt? Add a header to the quilt itself? 
No, I've, I don't think I've ever added to the quilt itself. I've added to the backing like this lots of time. And what kind of batting do you prefer? This is my favorite, which is Hobbs 80-20, 80% cotton, 20% poly. Um, has a little bit of loft more than 100% cotton does, less than 100% polyester does. So it's got the washability, durability, doesn't remember folds-ness of polyester. And it has the lower loft and the kind of shrinkage a little bit that cotton has. And I love that look in a washed quilt that it gets that crinkly look. So to me, best of both worlds, super economical batting. It's my favorite. Doris, do you ever center your quilt sandwich on the bars? Frankly, I don't, Doris. And especially I don't when I'm filming because I'm trying to manage where cameras and lights and Stella all are. I don't. I just put my straight edge on the front. And as you saw, run it off the back and roll it on. And wherever that is, is. Um, when I'm doing more fiddly quilts, I do more processes of measuring my top as I'm quilting. Probably not going to happen today. Sue, so, when loading the backing to the front rail using the red snappers, I have trouble keeping the leader up over the belly bar with the weight of the leader. Any suggestions? Absolutely. Which side can you see me at? This one. So I've got my little clamp here. And you'll see when I'm finished this quilt and unload it, I prep for the next one. I pull that leader up and over and I clamp it right in the corner on both sides. So there's a clamp holding on to the leader. The clamps on the Bernina are elastic, so they're not 100% foolproof because it can stretch, but it's usually enough to just hold that leader up in place for me. Yep. Madge, clarity, add a header to the top and bottom of the backing was my question. Gotcha. Yes, Madge, I absolutely have done that. And truth be told, that's what I should have done today too. It would have saved me another half an inch at the other end or inch. Um, but in the interest of time and because I was already making you guys sit and wait for so long, I just went ahead with adding it on one end. So I'm going to grab another sip of magic elixir. Okay. Um, Dave's saying he's sorry if he's missed any questions, but here's a helpful tip. If you put a cue in front of your question, then he can search for all the cues and find them easily amidst all the comments that are coming through. So that's a great thing. And if we've missed a question, would you mind just typing it in again with a cue and then we'll come back to it. All right, I think we're ready to get our top on here. Oh, here's one more. It might not last long enough. Dave Kirsty, happy to see your ideas for my machine regarding the red snappers and the ladies comment about giving them a hot bath. They're easier to put on if you lift one end while pushing along, they open up more. And that is very true, Kirsty. And I think I've talked about this in a couple episodes. Uh, let me grab one here. So what Kirsty's saying is if you bend them back, it causes the channel to open up a little more as you're putting them on. And that is absolutely true. For me, I also find that my material tends to shift then. So I prefer to lay it down and hold it in place and then snap, 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 snap. That's personal preference. So try both ways and see what works for you. Here is our gorgeous quilt. Yay! So it is red and tan and blue. It is not a true white. I got to make sure to get the right bits up and down. I have chosen today to load the quilt vertically. So exactly as it would be oriented on a bed. Um, you've probably noticed in other episodes, I will often, for the sake of efficiency, load my quilt longwise this way because it means I'm getting, you know, a bigger percentage of the quilt done in each pass and fewer passes because it's shorter this way, right? So for efficiency, I often do that. But today, for a couple reasons, I chose to go this way. Number one, I was able to load my backing with a selvage top and bottom, which gave me a nice straight edge. Sometimes where seams are placed will influence that decision. And then lastly, for today, I'm going to do a wavy quilting design and I want it to go from side to side not from top to bottom, so I didn't want to turn the quilt. Makes sense? So what you're quilting can influence that decision as well. So I'm actually going to pull my batting up just a little more to actually overlap that basting seam. And then I'm going to butt my quilt right up against it, like quarter inch away from that seam. And I am centering my quilt across the backing, eyeballing, mind you, it's not millimetric precision. Um, because there are two seams that are symmetrical, I'm going to try and center the quilt symmetrically as well. 
So I've got the same distance um, and I'm just looking at that seam underneath. I can see how much I'm extending beyond that seam. And you know what? There are seams in multiple directions, so it actually really doesn't matter because they're all over the place. I saw two that were symmetrical, but now I see some that are not at all. So I don't, in fact, have to worry about that. So I'm just arranging my quilt now so it's right up against my trusty little extender seam. And then when the quilt is finished, I'll just yank out that basting, save my green leader for the next project, and Bob's your uncle. I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. Thread choices. Let's talk about those for a minute. Do we have questions before the thread, Mr. Producer, sir? Um, Okay. Rebecca, can you show how to use the magnetic strips? I, I absolutely will. I'll be doing those in just a moment. Mm -hmm. And again, my red snappers are too loose. Any suggestions? Oh my, I've, I've never heard that before, I don't think. Honestly, I think I would contact the red snapper people and see if they have any suggestions. If you could run them through the dishwasher, I'd suggest that because I know that's really good at shrinking Tupperware lids. Ask me how I know that. Okay, Mr. Producer says go ahead. He's looking for some more questions that he saw. So actually, I think I'll pull Stella off to the side and um, talk about thread for a minute. I have a black screen, Dave. Is there any way I can see what I'm doing or no? Is this on the screen okay? Mr. Producer's doing some searching in behind. And so that's what I'm seeing on the screen. So here are a few thread thoughts that I had. You know, there are a number of ways I could go. I always say, ask any two quilters and you'll get three opinions about thread. But here's how I arrived at today's choice. I looked at red because red is pretty. But, you know, and you probably can't really see this on camera. But this is kind of how I judge it. You spool a little bit out, a yard or two, and you drop it various places on the quilt. And what happens with the red is when it's on the red fabric, it pretty well disappears, right? It matches. But then it comes over into this tan and it's like, boom. And so there's almost a start and stop is how the stitching looks. And I do not love that look. So right off the bat, I knew I didn't want red. We'll knot that up later. And then I looked at a blue and I actually picked a blue that's a few shades lighter than the blue in the quilt thinking, you know, that might bridge the gap. So again, pull out a couple yards. That is certainly better. It's lighter than the blue fabric, so I can see it on the blue. It's not quite as stop and start looking on the tan. Is it ideal? It's a thought. Let's keep that in the back of our mind. And the last one I looked at was this tan. It's a very warm tones of caramel in the tan. So it is several shades lighter, or sorry, several shades darker than the tan that's in the quilt, a lot lighter than the blue and a lot lighter than the red. So an argument could be made that it kind of disappears on the tan and it does color wise, but because that's a solid, it still shows up there. And here was the final deciding factor for me was looking at the backing. It is mostly tan, right? So I decided to go with this. Um, I could have gone with deeper shades of the tan too. I just, I happen to really like this one and it matches the stars in all these prints. So it's kind of sparkly, but an option would have been to go a couple shades deeper with the tan. Again, lessening the contrast on the blue and the red, heightening the contrast on the tan. So those are some of the options at play, but this is the one I chose. So I've got it already loaded and it is Isocord 100% poly thread and the color is 0761 if anyone uses that brand of thread and wants to know exactly what I have. I, for the most part, use 100, 0761 was the color. For the most part, I use 100% poly thread for all my quilts. Um, it's very strong and it's very low lint. And those are great factors for a long armor. I know you can't see it super well, but I'm pulling this up a little bit so I can baste a little larger area in place. Let's take a couple questions before I start basting. 
Panette, what are you using to store your red snappers? I have a similar system and I'm having a problem with storage. Can you see it there? It's it's a vase, like, a, like an entryway tall vase that I had on hand and it's just the perfect size for stacking them in. That's what I use. And Patricia, did you just say, and Bob's your uncle? Yes, I did. Bob's your uncle, like presto, voila. <laughs> Carolyn, how do you get your machine to stay still? Mine rolls away. Carolyn, that is an issue of leveling. Get out a big old level, like we used a, probably a four footer, yes, Mr. Producer? Yeah. And we leveled front to back, side to side, all over the place on my machine until she would stay still and until the level bubble was level. That's a leveling issue. And it will make your quilting a lot easier. So I encourage you, it's worth spending an hour to get it level. And most machines will have some kind of fine adjustment on the legs. You might need a jack to help you hold the machine while you adjust them. It's a bit of a process, very worthwhile. So now we are going to base this baby in place. Yes, we are. Okay, I'm pausing for a moment. Mr. Producer lost one camera. So I think I'm going to go ahead and base Dave um, so you won't see a close up of it, but we got to get going here too. Do we have to turn things off in order to do it? Okay. Okay, you guys, coffee break, 30 second coffee break. I'm just going to get my needle fixed in place and we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to unplug the camera and get it back in. So let's talk for a minute. You guys can see me a little bit. Um, I'll keep talking while he does that. He's just got to unplug and replug in one of the cameras. Let us talk about a floating top. What a floating quilt top means is all of it is hanging down in front of me. Literally floating over top of the rails. Um, and I know you can only see me in a teeny tiny camera, but I gave you that big picture, that visual. And for me, this is so time saving because I don't have to do that extra rolling of the quilt. Um, it's very much a matter of personal preference though. I know people who always roll their tops on, but again, you saw me earlier and I was talking about why I've chosen to roll my backing onto a different bar. So for me, I weighed the pros and weighed the cons as it relates to my style of quilting. And I chose to roll my backing on what should have been the bar for rolling up the top, right? I'm so used to floating my tops. That's what I've always done. And I have other ways of compensating, of keeping it stable rather than rolling it onto a bar. So that's what I've chosen. So camera is back in business. Here we are back to basting. So I've got a basting stitch on that's a quarter inch. Um, and that's what I'm going to run up the side here. And those red lights you're seeing are my stitch regulator. There's two red lights because there's actually two cameras that are regulating that stitch. So now I'm going to walk around my machine and lock my belts in place, which is going to give me a beautiful straight line across the top of that quilt. If you have ch mechanical channel locks, which I used to have, on my last machine, those are great for this same purpose, but either way, it's super helpful to have this really straight line across the top of your quilt. And I've tried to lay it out straight already, but I go slowly and I make adjustments as I baste across the top because I know the stitching is straight. If my, if my edge of my quilt is not going straight under it, then I adjust the quilt to match the stitching. Does that make sense? That's the beauty of locking this one long seam in place. just a little higher. It's easier to pull it down while you're stitching than to pull it up. So I try and be generous with pulling it up and then I can use my thumb here to pull it down a little if I need to. This is a little fiddly because I've got that bulky seam allowance. It's right underneath this edge. So it's kind of lifting things out of kilter a bit. So I'm just taking it slow. You may notice I've got my left hand beside the arm. The long arm is right here. And there's a little bit of excess fullness in here. And even when it's flat, your hopper foot will often push that out in front of you. So I just put some tension on, on the side that's already been stitched to take up that excess. And when I need to take up a little more, I grasp the edge of the quilt and pull on it a little bit. 
but just putting that little pressure on the fabric will help it go under the needle just a smidge faster and it won't let the hopper push it out front. All of this combines, it accumulates if you will, to contribute to a nice square finished result. And there we are at the corner and now I have to walk around again. This is how I get my steps in people. To take my channel lock off. Now I could put my opposite lock in place for doing this vertical line. I choose to just eyeball it. Um, that's entirely up to you. You also could lay a ruler on it. There we are. Our edge is basted. And now we shall have a quick look at the um, magnetic bars. One thing I have not put on my machine yet is a fixed place for my thread snips. Let's see. I'm going to hang them on my thread spool for today. Remind me they're there if I forget, okay? All right, so we've got, we've got the top edge stabilized. We've got the right and the left basted. But now I do want to put that little bit of tension on to keep any wrinkles from forming and also to keep that top seam pulled nice and snug because it's wanting to wrinkle up. And because the edges of my backing are not perfectly straight, it's a little bit fiddly to get them in my side clamps. These clamps are part of the Red Snapper system too. Um, but they have a very, very, very narrow little channel, about an eighth of an inch that the fabric has got to fit into. So I'm just using a pin to smooth it in there. What I like about these clamps is that they're really long. So a whole bunch of this area has even tension on it. I really like that. The clamps that come with my machine are just single clamps and they're, they're beautiful clamps, but I don't like putting them directly on the fabric because they just have that one tension point. And if you have them very tight at all, you end up with a sort of scalloped edge. So they work well in conjunction with some type of grips like the red snappers. And I just put a gentle tension on, just enough to hold it flat. I'm not stretching it like a drum, just enough to hold it flat. Let's move Stella a hair, maybe to the other side. Yep, this is fine, Dave. And I'll show you the magnets. So these magnetic bars, they are just hardware store variety. Same type of thing you would get to put in your garage for putting tools on, exactly like that. Doesn't matter what brand. They're heavy, they're very magnetic, watch out for your fingers. But this is what I use to stabilize this edge of my quilt. And they just clamp right on. So this is why I choose to have my backing rolled on a different bar so that this bar only ever has one layer of backing, one layer of batting, one layer of quilt. And my magnets always hold infallibly. That's it. So what I've got now is a quilt that is stable on all four sides. And now I can quilt. Nothing's going to shift. I don't have to worry about all of this that's floating in front of me. It's not going to move. Even if I move it out of the way and I do, I kind of push it under the machine so that I'm not stepping on it. That won't hurt it. It's not going to shift because everything is fixed in place. Just like that. I think we're ready to start quilting. Can you believe it? It's been a morning. I need more coffee while we uh, answer a couple more questions. Oh, coffee is so good. Even lukewarm. Possibly not even lukewarm. <laughs> Beverly, does this machine come with a ruler base? It is an extra um, accessory. That's what I'm trying to say. But yes, I do have one for it. And Diane, are you still using your measuring tape to keep the quilt square? Do you know, Diane, I have been. This particular frame is not as easy for attaching it across the frame like I used to do. So I'm going to actually attach it to my leveler or dead bar so that it's fixed always there. I've just been laying it across the top and today I don't even think I'm going to. I have so many pieces of equipment in my way. I'm going to do it without a tape measure. I, I think I've done enough quilts that I can count on um, still getting a good result, even just eyeballing it. That's what I'm doing today. Being honest here. Gwenna, I added some drawer knobs to my magnetic bars. Actually, I've done that too, Gwenna. And for those of you who don't 
there we go. You can see perhaps there's a hole, a pre-drilled hole in all the brands I've ever seen. And I did that too at one point, but mine kept coming untwisted. And so I've just gotten used to slipping my finger under the end, but do whatever works for you. If knobs help, absolutely. Super easy to attach knobs to them. It's a good tip. More questions? Is that it? Okay. As I get started quilting, please do remember, hit that like button. That really helps these videos to get seen. Um, subscribe, hit the bell, and you will get notifications whenever I'm going live. And share this with your friends that you think might be interested. Let's get quilting. After I get going a little bit, I'll try and take the stitch regulator off so you guys don't have to see those red lights all the time. But I just need to get my, get my groove going a little bit first. These waves are a great way to add just some gorgeous texture to a quilt. And it's a little bit like a flag blowing in the breeze, a little bit. They are not perfect, but viewed en masse over the whole quilt, they really do add the most awesome texture. I just stopped myself from saying one of my favorite designs, because I say that about every design, don't I? Okay, let's take the stitch regulator off. Now you can see I'm having to move a little more slowly than I did with the stitch regulator on. I could speed it up more, but it's already going at a pretty good clip. Um, so I've chosen to just adjust my quilting a little bit. I've got it at 1400 stitches per inch right now, or sorry, 1400 stitches per minute not per inch. Gosh, no. If I go too much faster, I don't have time to, you know, make adjustments or whatever. There's just a limit to how fast you can go and still um, make decisions on the fly when you need to. And having stitched a little bit with the stitch regulator on, now I'm trying to make my stitches match that. I had it set at 10 per inch. So now I'm trying to make my stitch length quite similar to that. If any of you follow me on social media, yesterday I posted, I guess it's just an Instagram, I posted a reel and then photos, which would be on Facebook as well, um, of a quilt I did. It's kind of deep greens and olivey greens and reds and cream. And that whole quilt I did with the manual mode on. And I took some close-ups of the stitching so that you can see it is quite, quite possible to do even a fairly intricate pattern that way. And I certainly find it relaxing to quilt with this constant motor speed. What do you guys think of the waves? Was that the right choice? And each wave is about mm, six or seven inches wide. And at the widest part between them, more than an inch, inch and a quarter, maybe even inch and a half. So that gives you an idea of the scale.
now that we're inches and inches into it, I'm just going to take a moment and check my tension. It's easier actually from the other side. Are you able to put a different camera on, Dave, for a moment? Mr. Producer is just messing with tripods. Wait till he gets back to his desk there. To the control panel. What do they call it in the Star Trek? The, uh, the bridge. The bridge. That's what we'll start calling it. Okay. Just wanted to show you this because it's an extra little tip that might help you. An easy way to check that your tension is good without literally crawling under the quilt is reach under and run your fingernail firmly across the bottom of those stitches. And if there's any laddering or eyelashing going on, like if your bottom tension is too tight, you will immediately feel that with your fingernail. Of course, you can see it on the top. So that's a pretty good judge that tension stitches are forming nicely under there. Okay, we're going to have a wee discussion here, and I'm going to get my cup while we do it. So apparently several of you are asking, can you see my feet while I'm quilting? And absolutely. Um, Dave's trying to work out a camera where you can kind of see them. But I'll tell you what I'm doing because you'll see it in action. I'm working honestly like a dancer would. And, you know, I, I don't kid myself <laughs> that I have that skill set. But like a dancer would, I'm, I'm thinking of my leading foot. And I, that's what I move with, but that's not what I hold my weight on. So I kind of keep my leading foot lightweight and I take a step and then the weight goes back on the following foot. And you'll see that in action. And that's how I am able to move without ever stopping and without lurching. If you let your weight go onto your leading foot as you're leaning over and then you try and take a step, you will inevitably bob and lurch and your quilting will show it. Okay, so I'll keep quilting. You guys can have a look-see. And the feet are bare. They pretty much always are. doesn't work as smoothly when I think about it, honestly. It's kind of funny. And I'm keeping an eye on where my basting stitch ended, like how close it came to me at the front of the machine. Because I came as far forward with that stitch as my bar underneath would allow me to, that gives me a guideline. Oh, oh, oh. hang on. That gives me a guideline where, um... oh boy, we have a problem. Let me finish my sentence. <laughs> how far forward I can quilt rows. So have you got the close up camera on? This is a life lesson, you guys. Oh dear, and our close-up camera is not working. Well, I will give you a blow-by-blow -blow account. So I've got the narrow little um, uh, darning foot it's called on. It's a little round one. And I came across a seam that was not fully stitched down. And that darning foot slipped right under the seam 
and of course continued stitching. So I have stitched my foot into place. So I am just extremely carefully getting in here and undoing some of the stitching. And after that, I have got a heck of a trick to show you how to get past that without it happening again. But it is going to take me a minute to get this out. My presser foot is stitched in there like crazy. And I really want to try to not make a hole. Dave, could you do me a favor? Could you find me a pair of glasses, even yours? I need some magnification or maybe even hold a phone for me. Um, and I need to turn my light on. I've got it off so that you guys can see me quilt. So this is a little bit of a process here. So good time to type in some questions if you have them. This is going to take a couple of minutes to try and get this out without getting a hole. I probably will need magnification, yes. We mentioned live and unscripted. Yeah, have we mentioned yet today that these are live and unscripted? You can see where my problem is, right? So I've slid right under this seam. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You, I, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm looking at my husband's phone here, standing over my shoulder and thinking you're seeing the same thing you're not. Anyway. Do you want to snap a photo or two and put them up? Just, yeah, the bright light is helping. I'm just endeavoring to get those few stitches out of there without cutting a thread from the fabric. That's my goal. Let's we'll see if I can achieve it. Are there any good questions, Dave, I could be talking about while I'm doing this? Well, if you want to put a question up, I will read it and then um, talk while I'm undoing, because that I can do. Beverly, can a person do pantographs with the Bernina? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's just not my personal skill set or choice, but absolutely you can. Um, it's it's another, I believe, it's an accessory as well to, to add the back handlebars, etc. And I don't have them because that's not my personal choice. I'm wondering if I got, if I literally crawled under the quilt, if I could see this from underneath. Because there are a couple of stitches that are catching and I'm afraid if I push, I'm going to actually cut the fabric and I don't want to do that. I don't care if I snip the batting a little bit. Look at that, I got it. I got it, I got it, whew. So. Question again. Let's have a couple while we. I've got something else on the screen, Dave, your search. Whew. <laughs> Amy, is dead bar same as idler rail? Hmm, I haven't actually heard the idler rail term. Um, I've heard leveler bar, but it's basically just kind of on top of my quilt. So my quilt is feeding smoothly under it and then rolling up on the take up bar. So chances are it is the same thing, yep. Rebecca. Now, when you take the magnetic strips off, does it not pucker up? I've had that problem. How do I fix it? Do you mean puckering from side to side, Rebecca? And the answer is no. Um, like I take care that my backing is nicely stretched underneath there. Do you just mean because of the quilting pulling up? It shouldn't. I feel like if it's doing that, you were maybe stretching it too hard and then it's pulling together. But if your top and your bottom are even tension, they shouldn't pull significantly in when you take the magnetic bars off, no. We might have to talk more about that in another episode. Oh dear, you're having a rough morning, but great learning for us watching hugs. I appreciate that because sometimes you just want everything to go right, right? But you don't learn as much that way. How are you keeping your horizontal rows even? You know, part of it is I've done this design a bajillion times, but also I'm using the seam lines in my quilt. So there is a seam line every, I think it's six inches. So that's a good sort of visual. Every six inches, right? I know, oh, the bottom of my wave should be touching that seam so I can, that helps me to keep them straight. 
Joan, I've learned so much from Susan by watching these. Would you be able to show her feet? Okay, we got that question. Crossing one foot over the other. See, I have done that, Joan. One time I actually did post a video doing the whole grapevine as I was tootling back and forth behind the quilt, but I wasn't doing it today. Where can we see these finished quilts if we don't do Facebook or Instagram? Well, I will put one finished photo in the thumbnail of the YouTube episode. I'm not sure where else I can load photos on YouTube because they like they usually are in social media, right? Um, if I remember, I'll try and put one in my newsletter, Cindy, just for you. I'll try and remember that. I'll try and remember that to put it in the next newsletter. How's that? Christine, does the sock help with preventing the unraveling of the thread by the needle? I often notice my thread gets loosely unwound by the needle. It probably does help with that, Christine. What it particularly helps with is not like sometimes when the thread is pulling like more pulls and then there's a loop that sags and it just helps it feed more smoothly. It's just one more very gentle touch on the thread that helps it feed smoothly instead of jerking it off the spool. That's why I use it. How are we for questions? More? Oh, lots. <gasps> what size needle do you use? Right now I have a 130 slash 705, which is like a universal needle and the size is 9014. That's what I have loaded right now. And that's kind of my typical. Been there, not happy, Susan says. Not been happy. Thanks for showing us your process. Is your S in the top right corner styled as a nod to traditional singer? Do you know, I did not think of that when I was doing it. We were just trying to put a bold, you know, something that identifies you're watching Stitched by Susan because people are tuning in and out all the time. Speaking of tuning in and out, if you have a moment, hit the like button and the subscribe button. I would sure appreciate that if you're just tuning in. This is very live and unscripted today. Multiple things are going wrong and you get to see it all in real time. Bobby, I missed a lot of the beginning. How do you eyeball where the wave touches? Simply with practice, Bobby. And this is a design that it's important that you do alternating left to right and right to left. There are tons of other wavy designs if your machine doesn't like quilting that way. But for this particular one to get this particular look, you got to alternate directions. And I do just eyeball it. Practiced on, you know, plexiglass or paper first and then just eyeball it. More questions? Are we ready to get sewing? Mr. Producers got lost in all the questions. Dorothy, is it intentional to have such a regular appearance to the pattern? That is, have the waves meet. It is intentional, Dorothy. And when you're quilting it, you, you can have a different look if you want by making them meet in a different way or not meet at all. That's up to you. But this is how I do this one usually, yeah. Bobby is so good when you're having a morning. Sue Hansen, if the foot attaches like a Bernina machine foot, release it when trying to pick out stitched over. Ask me how I know. Sue, that is a fantastic tip and I didn't think of that because I'm not yet used to that. I literally can just detach my foot just like you can on a sewing machine and I could have moved Stella out of the way and that would have made my life quite a bit easier. I'll remember that next time. <laughs> okay, that's it for questions. All right. I have a nifty knifty tip for you guys. Basically what's going to happen with this, and we don't have a close-up camera now to show you exactly, but there's an area, um, there's an area about three quarters of an inch long that's not stitched in that seam that has come open. And eventually someone's gonna wanna go back and hand stitch that, but I'm not gonna do it right now, but here's what I am gonna do. Painter's tape to the rescue. I'm going to put a little piece of tape over top of that seam. I'm going to quilt right over top of it and then I'll rip the tape off. Where did it go? Well, there it is, right under the handlebars. And that will hold it down so that it stitches right in place and I don't risk getting stuck under it again. Okay, Mr. Producer says, let's give us him a minute. He's going to try and reset that camera one more time. It's a GoPro and we're not quite sure what the problem is. But we're going to give it one more reset and see if we can get it fixed. It's a day, isn't it? Some days are just like this. And you know what? You just keep going. One foot in front of another. Do the grapevine if you can. We do call this the quilting reality show. And this is reality. This is sometimes how it goes, like cameras aside, but just with quilting, this is sometimes how it goes. You get a tension issue or you get a, and things just keep going wrong. And there's no magic fix. 
Although I will say some days when a lot, a lot of things go wrong, it's just time for a break sometimes. My needle is actually unthreaded, so let's quickly rethread that. And you know what? It's faster to just do it than to use the threader. Well, I appreciate you guys sticking around because this, you know, it has not been a smooth morning, has it, in any way. I'm just thinking, you guys, what I might do is actually put my, um, what is traditionally called the long arm foot on because it does have a, a thicker edge to it. I'm having a heck of a time. I can't even thread a needle today. Anyway, I am going to change feet because I feel like if there's any more scenes like this, that might be an issue as I'm going. So now that Sue has reminded me how easy that is to do, I'm going to quickly switch out that foot. And you can see how this foot has this wider base and is less likely to get caught under a finicky seam. Am I getting it right? I think so. I'm not. Hang on a second here. Everybody's learning. Susan is learning how to put a foot on the long arm. I'm not getting it. Hmm. There we go. Okay. I think we're in business, but I won't say that too loudly. So I'm going to overlap my stitching a good quarter inch from where I was before, which happens to be right under the tape. Let me just think here. Someone's asking, what does doing the grapevine mean? Oh gosh, it's like a dance step. So like you step over your previous foot and then behind, over and then behind, and it's just a little decorative kind of traveling step. I am undoing a few more stitches because my stitching was, it's on the blue for one thing, so it's very obvious. And also if I rewind, undo, unpick, whatever you wanna call it, to a place where there's a seam allowance, that has just locked the stitches a little bit more. So that's what I'm doing. I'm undoing to the last place that I was stitching through seam allowance. And that's right where I'm gonna put my lock stitches. I wanna be confident this doesn't come undone. You know, 10 washes down the road. So right there, I'll stop at the edge of that seam allowance. Snip my threads. Can you see that? And now I'm just gonna stitch over that last quarter inch that's right through that seam allowance. And that did not pull up a bobbin thread. Okay, the morning's troubles are not over. Where's my bobbin thread? <laughs> this is almost humorous, you guys. You gotta laugh or you'd cry, right? And now I dropped my bobbin. I mean, seriously, a series of unfortunate events. That's what is going on here. And all it was is because of that uh, stoppage, which happened when I was tangled up, right? It just broke the bobbin thread off quite short. So we'll just put it in fresh. All right. Take number 1,442. Lindy is asking, did you not tie off your stitches and sink them? You just snipped them off. I just snipped them off, Lindy. That is why I chose to do it at a seam allowance. That is why I'm choosing to stitch over the last quarter inch and really fix them down. I absolutely could have knotted them off. That was not the method I chose. Those five stitches in place, and I might do five more just for cuz, I'm pretty confident that will secure it like crazy. thread tails out of there. I'm going to leave the thread tails till I get going and cut them a little later. Okay, here's a comment that's going to make me feel better. I appreciate your calm demeanor during these oopsies and showing and telling us how you're resolving the issues. And honestly, Sue, that's kind of what this show is about. Because this is what I missed when I was learning quilting. Because I'm still learning things today, right? But not being able to see what someone else did in this situation. You second guess yourself. You don't know what decisions to make. So I'm just letting you guys see what it looks like. Okay, we're in business. Uh, there's a bit of a wobble there. I kind of forgot I was in manual mode. But you know, in the big picture, 
nobody is going to see that wobble. But I am going to take a moment now to go back and pull the tape off. And it just tears along the stitching line. Easiest thing in the world to pull off. And also, I am going to put a pin in that area. If you guys were not on screen, I would take a moment to get a safety pin. And, I'll, and I will do that later and tie a little flag of like fabric salvage around it and point it out to the, the person who's binding it so they can take a little bit of hand, you know, hand stitching thread and just anchor that in place. June, what happens to the loose bobbin thread when you start thread again? Um, I guess I didn't really show that, June. I actually pulled it up. I pulled the bobbin thread up and I hung on to both of them, anchored it, you know, with those lock stitches and then trimmed them both off. And you'll see the pin when I go back past you'll see me going past the pin and that's where the, it is and you'll see how not perfect it is but it is definitely stable and it's going to be fine and if i didn't point it out to you you would never never know I promise you that here it comes right there And now we have to stop and advance our quilt. So I'm undoing all the apparatus that is holding it in place. I'm just gonna toss these thread spools out of the way. Got too many things here. So the magnets come off, the side clamps come off. This is great, Carolyn says. Carolyn, I'm so glad you're having a good time. Mr. Producer is reminding me that there's a nice jar of Baileys upstairs after the show is over. We can uh, doctor our coffee a little bit and put our feet up. Someone is asking what size is the quilt top. It is 63 by, I'm going on memory here, I think it was 81. And my trusty green thingy has gotten a little bit tangled. I will get that fixed. So I'm just tucking my green tail into the take up bar and letting it roll up with the quilt as I go. Joan, thanks for being so transparent. I still kind of think she's perfect. Dave says you don't have to have a cue. That's not a question, but he's glad you pointed it out so he couldn't miss it. I added that last little bit, Joan. So I have to remember while I'm busy talking to you guys to take the uh, uh, manual stitch mode off when I'm doing this basting because it does kind of startle you when you've got it on a high speed and you push start, expecting a basting stitch to come out and instead, zoom, zoom. So I'm just repeating now the process that I did earlier, which is basting the left and the right side. My top obviously is already stable. My clips I set to one side. I do have to find a little magnetic device for putting my clips on. A few of you, by the way, have sent me emails and messages suggesting what you do with your clips. But so far, I think I'm going back to my original system, which was a tiny magnet to throw them on. Chiefly because I like them to be in the same orientation every time, which sounds ridiculous, but you pick them up so many times, it I like when they're placed exactly the same way. So for example, I have a little um, lanyard that I can hang around my neck with an extendable elastic. But I don't love that because my scissors kind of hang or my clips this way and that, right? So when I go to grab them, I'm like fumble, 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 trying to get my scissors going right. So I love the magnetic system because then they're always the same way. Okay, we've basted left and right. We shall put our magnets on again. So as I did that, you can see me in the little screen. As I did that, I didn't really point this out, but I will in the next pass. We've got a few more to go. But I'm eyeballing always my seam lines, the same way that I'm keeping my quilting kind of lined up based on the seam lines as, as a guide. I'm doing that along this front bar as well. So I can literally look down the quilt and this seam runs perfectly straight. This quilt is very nice and flat, which is lovely. But if it wasn't, 
I would be making an adjustment every time I do a pass. Don't wait till you get to the end of the quilt to figure out whether it's advancing levelly or not. Do it each and every time. That allows you, if you need to make adjustments, to do them before you're at the end and it's desperate. Now I have to see which way I gotta go. Start from the right. I had to think for a moment. Oh, I've gotta get my side clamps on yet too, people. You guys are so good at reminding me these things. I appreciate it. So often I get, you know, chatting and I forget the little bits like the magnets or the clamps. When I'm at home by myself, you know, it's all quiet and I'm just, I'm kind of routine. Do this, then do this, then do that. But when I get talking, the routine all goes to pot. Okay, there's one side clamp. And if you are watching this in a replay, by the way, feel free to still type in questions or comments. I do my very best to answer all the comments on these YouTube shows. And it is sometimes a few days later, but I really, really try to get back and answer them all. So like and subscribe. Share with your friends. I am here to try and help. Okay, we have another question. Thought? Kim, you're showing me that I can actually do this crazy love of long arming. Thanks so much for being real. You're so welcome, Kim. This is real. And it's still fun. Even when all this stuff happens, it's still going to be a beautiful quilt. So there's my lock stitch again. So I've got both thread tails in my hand. I hung on to them. I did those five tight stitches. I've got my machine set to do an automatic. Um, I push one button and I get those five lock stitches. And then I'll just leave the tails hang and I'll go on stitching. And I've got my manual mode on again. So here we go. I was thinking as all those things were sort of going wrong, one of the reasons that I always shout from the rooftops that I love freehand quilting is because it's fast. There's very little setup, loading, marking required. You know, so you guys watching this morning, if you aren't a regular viewer, you may be looking at this and think, oh my word, we've been here for an hour and you're only 18 inches into your quilt, which is true, but also true Think of if that seam episode had happened and I had been, my computer had been running the machine. I mean, I, nothing against computerized quilters. I do some of that too. But had that happened and I was not right there and able to turn it off in a split second, I would definitely have had a hole in this quilt. So this morning, I'm grateful. That's one more reason to love, you know, quilting from the front of the machine. You absolutely see what's happening. You're in control all the time. One of the reasons I love it.
Mr. Producer is exclaiming, it seems like the adventures are not over. The head cam is just not working well today. So I'm running along a seam line here and I am kind of mentally, you know, making fine adjustments. You can see with each dip, I'm going just a little bit under that seam line and some of them I'm having to dip a little wider and I'm going ahead and doing that to sort of get myself set up the right size and keep my waves in line. I've been going upwards a little bit, it looks like on the right hand side of the quilt and you know, it's not very much but seeing it now and making adjustments for it a little bit at a time, I will never end up with the waves, you know, angling several inches up one side of the quilt. So there's definitely something to be said for constantly, you know, kind of measuring, adjusting, evaluating, and making those changes a little bit at a time. No one's ever gonna notice the quarter inch that I was off, but someone would notice if it was four or five inches off. I'm going to pause at the end of this row and just check my bobbin level. We could be getting low on a bobbin. No, we're still good. I forget how little quilting we've actually done. It's all been troubleshooting. So you guys cannot see this, but I just paused. Um, I'm gonna get over to a camera where you can see me. Out of the corner of my eye, I, my needle thread is coming down, you know, through the threading apparatus. And out of the corner of my eye, as I'm stitching, I'm seeing thread flash. And right away, I think it shouldn't look like that. That's not quite right, right? So I paused at the end and had a look and my thread had come out of one of the guides. You know, probably not critical, but this is the advantage of like paying attention and knowing your machine, knowing what it sounds like or what it should look like. When I see that thread do a wobble that I know isn't right, I know to stop and look before I end up with something else going wrong and having to undo, hopefully, hopefully. I actually had two quilts this week that I had to do a bit of undoing on because I, I actually was having tension issues but they weren't as bad as they could be because I did that same thing. I was seeing the thread kind of pulling tight on the top. And as soon as I saw that happening, I stopped, advanced my quilt, had a look at it from underneath. And sure enough, my tension was not quite right. And so it was important that I look and see that. And it just, it alleviated what could have been a much worse problem if I had just persisted in quilting, right? Thinking, oh, it'll work itself out. One of them was actually last night. I had a baby quilt loaded thinking, oh, I can quickly get this quilt whipped out, you know, to be ready for today's live stream. And of course, then I had a tension issue and had to spend about 20 minutes unpicking. However, I was still grateful that I caught it fairly early and I didn't have, you know, an hour and a half of unpicking. And I got the baby quilt done. Here again, I'm getting close to a seam line. So this will, this next row will be my kind of measuring stick. Am I keeping things pretty lined up? I'm 
still going up a little bit toward the right. And there we are, time for an advance. Mr. Producer's telling me we have a new foot cam. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, you gotta have a sense of humor, don't you? In this show, we have a foot cam. We do not, however, have a foot fetish. Just saying. So this time I will show you a bit more. Every time I advance the quilt, I, I almost do this automatically without thinking. I make a few adjustments. So I go along the whole front and I tug both quilt and batting. I want to make sure that the batting is not pulling up in the middle underneath. That's been my experience is if I don't do anything, when I get to the bottom of my quilt, my batting has kind of gone this way and gone toward the middle and upwards. Maybe that's just my machine. Maybe it's the way I roll. I don't know. But trying to avoid that, I always give that batting that little tug. And if you want to be absolutely positive, you can actually lift up this floating front, smooth all that batting down, and then the quilt. I'm pretty confident about it. I mean, certainly you can feel. I am just looking. That seam is very bulgy under there. This is where the quilt was folded. This is the center line right here, and it was folded in half right at that seam. So a little side tip, if you're sending your quilt to a long armor, both backing and quilt, it's helpful if you fold beside the seam by even an inch. Because if you fold right on a seam, it literally folds it shut. So your pressing is sort of, it's going against that. So I am i can feel that seam really bulgy under there. So I'm laying it down and forcing it to lay down flat, even though it wants to fold up. There we go. Everything square, I've kind of eyeballed, you know, my seam along this front edge too. If I need to, tug in a few areas, make sure it's going on straight. I'm also keeping a weather eye kind of on the front of my quilt that's falling down in front of the machine here. I can see if it's got a smile forming or anything like that. All these things just help you to keep it managed. Got my basting stitch on, we're golden. Here we go. And again, I am just eyeballing this one. You certainly could use a ruler, put a channel lock on, pin it in place first, whatever suits your comfort level. And I keep setting down my little clips. Someone else suggested that I wear an apron. And I don't know, that seems like a really good idea. I even own one, like a bartender's apron, you know, with the kind of shallow pockets all across the front but it just seems unwieldy. Maybe again, because you're sort of fumbling in there for your scissors. You can't just reach, grab, and snip. I know, I ask a lot of my scissors. side clamps. Sure, you've got a question while I'm working? Bobby, just a tube sock around thread spool to help with tension? Oh, Bobby, I don't know that it really helps with tension. It just helps the thread to unspool smoothly. Does that make sense? So it's not providing much tension, if any on the thread. And, and I'll tell you why I started doing it. On my last machine, the spool holder was in a different location and it had a screw that stuck down underneath it. And if any of the thread sort of sagged down under there, it would grab that spool or that um, screw and break. And it happened to me so many times that I put this thread sock on to always keep my thread sort of up. And it just seems to add that, that extra level of smoothing out the flow of the thread. But I mean, every little bit helps with tension, so it might, it might help. 
Shelby, I am also a fast quilter. What settings do you use when you're using the stitch regulator? I have a Q24. I've been using the 10, 10 stitches per inch. And on my last machine, I always did 12 and sometimes 13, but the 10 per inch on here seems quite fine. So I have not fiddled with that a whole lot, but currently I'm using 10 per inch when I have the stitch regulator on. Bobby, again, sometimes the middle of my quilt advances less than the ends. Perhaps I should say my edges stretch. Why would that happen? Oh, a ton of reasons, Bobby. If you go back into other episodes, I have featured quilts that have, you know, borders that have excess fabric in them or whatever. Um, that just basically happens if your quilt is not perfectly flat. Or even if when you're basting, your hopper foot is pushing that out in front of you and you're not managing that and getting it pulled under the, the hopper foot, that can happen in a little way, a little bit at a time. So you, you're always kind of managing that. How do you bring your bobbin thread up when you're picking stitches out? Just take one stitch and then grab that loop, right? It forms one stitch. So the, the bobbin thread goes around your top thread. And then if you pull that loop out, there's your bobbin thread. What have I not done? Magnets. Oh, okay. A few more questions. Amy, would I be able to do this wave pattern left to right and right to left on my Burgundy Q16? I'm using it on a folding table. I have not done it on a sit down machine. I think you would have to do it in a smaller scale because you're going to have to stop to reposition your hands, right? And I would say you want to be able to get two or three waves before you stop. And maybe you stop wherever the waves are touching each other to make that less visible. I see no reason why you can't try though. Sharon, do you know the book Alexander and the Horrible No Good Very Bad Day? He wants to go to Australia to get away from everything and his mom says things are like that even in Australia. I don't know that book, but I can tell already that I love it because things are like that sometimes. Um, the bobbin thread picking stitches out, we got that one already. And Madge, the pauses give us time to think, reflect, and ask better questions. No worries and no apologies ever for sharing your expertise. Thanks, Madge, for your vote of confidence. Appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Producer thinks that's it for questions. So magnets are up next. Let me put my pin away. Um, for Was it Bobby that was asking about you know, the middle coming up faster. Um, Bobby, yes, that happens to me. You pull the middle a bit. I do pull the middle a bit. And I do think that's what makes the magnets critical as well. Because if you base the sides and then you quilt stuff in the middle and you have nothing holding it here, it will pull up. And it might only pull up a quarter of an inch. But this quilt is going to have, I think, six advances. Six times a quarter of an inch is an inch and a half. That's going to be a significant curvature, right? So what you're doing is with each pass, you're managing in small increments so that you never have that giant big problem at the end. Ruth, do you base the sides before you put the side clips on? I do, Ruth, because then I feel like I have even tension on both layers of my quilt, right? As opposed to stretching the back first and then having the top lay on it with no tension at all. Then I feel like the back is more stretched. That's my opinion. So I do baste first before I side clip. More questions? That's it. Okay, now I gotta figure out what side I'm at again. The right. Because these waves are alternating directions, right? So as I get going, please take a moment to like and share, especially the thumbs up button is so, so helpful. Um. Manual. There we go. So while I quilt, um, remember that these YouTube channels, while they will always remain free, they are just a smattering. They're just kind of a, uh, what's the word I want? A glance, an overview of what quilting these designs can be like. And they're kind of in support of my masterclass, which is an intensive course on quilting some of these designs, including this waves one. And what I mean by intensive is, you know, I, I take this design apart piece by piece. I demo it step by step at the long arm machine. Um, I show some of its pitfalls, things you should watch for, tips for making it better, um, doodle sheets where you can practice by tracing over my lines those sorts of things. So in that masterclass are just over 30 
individual designs. As I said, this is one of them. And then for those of you who have already taken that, or maybe just have quite a bit of quilting experience under your belt, but still want some more um, original freehand designs, I also have a monthly subscription membership called Advance. So it's a way that you can kind of stay in touch with me. There's a Facebook group that goes with it. It's totally optional, but a lot of members choose to join that because it gives them access to me and you can share photos in there and ask questions and so forth. And each month I publish a couple new pieces of content. Sometimes it's a new design. Sometimes it's a guest speaker. Um, more custom quilting type things are featured in that than in my master class. So that's a brief overview of those. They can both be found at my website, stitchedbysusan.com under the classes tab. And something is pulling. Is it a cord? So again, I feel resistance. And so I'm just stopping and assessing what it is. And it happens to be a camera cord. So bear with us while we... Now you get to see Mr. Producer's back of his head. Command strips have let us down. All of our cables, you can see the black... Um, cable holder that he's affixing there. They're hung up with command strips and they failed. <laughs> what else can go wrong today, you guys? <laughs> so I'm finding my seam ripper because again, I'm going to back up a little bit because I've got a fair sized wobble on there. And some very, very, very tiny stitches because of that resistance. But we'll get it. Sorry, you don't have a little cam to see what I'm doing. I was thinking to myself, oh, here's a good chance to show knotting and varying threads. But you can't really get a good view of that today, so I won't take the time to do it. So I'm just undoing oh, about three inches to get back to, once again, a place where I'm crossing a seam allowance. Somehow those multiple layers of fabric help to really anchor my quilting threads. So I'm clipping my threads close to the quilt. Then I'm going to stitch over about a quarter inch of the previous stitching with some lock stitches and anchor that in place. So I take one stitch, grab that bobbin thread and pull it up and now I'm hanging on to both threads and locking five stitches right tight, not right on top of each other, but almost all five of them are within less than an eighth of an inch. And then I take a deep breath because it's going to take off at a great rate, right? Get ready. And then I'll come back later and clip the threads. If you clip the threads right away, they'll just yank right out when your machine starts stitching. In my experience. Well, when things go smoothly, we get along pretty quickly, don't we? So I'm coming up again on another seam line, and I'm seeing that once again, my tendency is to go upwards on the right. Don't they say that's a sign of an optimistic person when their handwriting goes, slopes upward on the right? Must be true of quilters too. So once again, I'm just thinking about it a little bit take generous waves on this right hand side, 
little bit slimmer waves on the left hand side. Just a touch. Take a moment and check my bobbin. Still good. So the bobbin on the Bernina, my, my reading is a percentage. So what I've done is tried to figure out how many threads are on a full, how many yards, sorry, are on a full bobbin. And then it will give me a percentage of how much of that I've used. It is not an absolute precise science. For example, if you have a lot of stops and starts, that's not really accounted for because it's accounting for the length when you're stitching, when it's traveling across the stitch regulator, but it gives you a very good idea of where you're at. And also I was messing this week with the bobbin winder. It was winding a little bit too full and I was having a little trouble with my bobbin when I first loaded a fresh one. Um, it was literally providing friction against the bobbin casing because it was just a little bit too full. So I made a couple adjustments to load a little bit less on my bobbin. So now I have to do a couple bobbins and run them right out to try and determine what my yardage is again. But it's about 140, which is not bad. That goes for a very long time, as you can see. Moving my apparatuses out of the way. Alrighty, time to advance again. While we do that, once again, hit that thumbs up like button. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. We endeavor to air these live episodes the first and the third Friday of each month. As I'm filming today, we are in February and I'll give you a heads up, although it will also be in my newsletter. In March, I will again be live and unscripted on the second and third Fridays. Not the first one, I'll be traveling that first one. And that first one actually is in Puyallup, Washington. Extra creds if you know how to pronounce that name or spell it. Um, there's a show there called Sew Expo and it's a four day um, quilting event that I'll be at. So that's going to be fun. So if you're in that area, yeah, come out and see the show and I'll be in the Bernina booth a lot of the time. I haven't gotten used to my red solo cup being back. I was talking to a quilting friend the other day and asking her what she does with her thread snips. And she keeps a trash can at the end of her long arm and, and walks every time. Because I asked her that specifically. I'm like, you walk every time? 
Yes, she said, that's how I get my steps in. Isn't that funny? I mean, funny, but great, really. I certainly use that philosophy in my sewing room with my ironing station. I have never had an ironing station right next to my sewing machine where I can just swivel and use it and then swivel back and keep sewing. I get up every single time for ironing. Same philosophy applies. It's good to get up and move. Can you guys see... I don't know if this camera on the left would show, Dave, this edge of the quilt here where I am. Not really. So I'll, I'll show you as best I can. No, I'll, I'll grab it as best I can. This fabric right here, because there's a fair bit of it extending beyond my quilt and especially beyond my batting, which is making this fluffy, this is not nearly as fluffy, right? It's just fabric. So if you're on Instagram, I showed a reel of this this week, but I'll give it to you guys too. If you tug on the last layer and then sweep that under and tuck it right under your take up bar, that pulls this edge nice and smooth again. Which makes it much easier to put in your side clamps. And in fact helps your quilt stay straight. Otherwise it seems like the whole quilt sags even though it's just the backing sagging. Feels like the whole thing is just not, you know, firmly held in place. So that can really help and it's super easy fix. Okay, do we have any questions that I should address before I dive in again? Or that I can even talk about while I'm quilting? So there are my magnets all in place. I think we're ready to sew again. I'm gonna get another sip in of my magic elixir. Okay, Cindy, on the business end, I'd like to hear about paying taxes end of things, the process. Okay, so this is following on the heels of Mr. Producer has been typing into the comments about the podcast and the fact that in the next um, two months or so, some of the episodes that I'm releasing are either guests or some, sometimes just me, but a little more business related. So, you know, vis gaining visibility or things like that. And Cindy's asking, she'd like to hear more about taxes and those sorts of things. So I appreciate knowing that because I'm thinking about doing a series that way too. I'm trying to balance, you know, I want the podcast to be enjoyable and have stories of real people and real quilters but there are so many of you asking these sort of brass tacks questions about how do you establish a quilting business and where do you start so i'm pretty seriously thinking about doing a series you know and that may come this summer then because i do it quite a bit in advance but yeah thanks for thanks for letting me know what your interest is gwenna do you base the bottom of the quilt when you get down to that since you can't use the magnets then yes i do yes i do and Rebecca, I'd love to take your classes. They're a way to break them down so they are more affordable. There is, Rebecca, an option of three equal monthly payments. And the class will be coming out in April. I'll be talking about it again, opening it up again, having some workshops and things that are free in advance of it. And all that information will be there. I think it's probably on the website too. I can't right off the top of my head think of that now, but I think it is. Roxanne, what skill level is the master class geared towards? Roxanne, what it does not include is the is the preparation, like the loading of a quilt or squaring up your backing, those sorts of technical things. It is strictly about the freehand quilting. However, the designs range. There are some quite beginner designs and there are some quite intricate designs. And I tried to mix them up a little bit because it's also... It's about the skill. It's about building your skill set of, of repeatable motions. It's about advancing your control of the machine so that you can do any design you want. And I also talk a fair bit about adapting things that you see, ideas that you have into quilting designs. How do you make that quiltable, repeatable, usable? So that's kind of all part of it. So is it for the ultra beginner that just got their long armor yesterday, their long arm machine yesterday? You know, it might stretch them. However, you do have access to it forever. It does not ever expire. So you can take those beginner ones and fiddle around with them and wait two or three months to come back to the more advanced ones if you want to. Christine, 
Have you played with double needles or couching yet? I have not, Christine. Thanks for reminding me. It's like five weeks since I came home from my extended stay in Canada. And as you can imagine, when I came home, what a backlog of quilts. I, I think that first week, 18 quilts came in, people that had been waiting and lined up. So I've just been quilting. I haven't had much time to play, sadly. Okay, let us get quilting. And every time I have to look back now, which way was I going? Because again, this is a design that does alternate. So once more, let me just do that again to show you. We don't have a head cam though, do we? Oh, you can see it. So I have on the Bernina, there are, there are four buttons and I can program them to do whatever it is that I want them to do. So I've got one programmed to take one stitch with a quick push and to do my lock stitches with a long push. So that's what I use for starting like this. So one stitch and then I just pull up the bobbin thread, hang on to both of those. And now if I hold it down, I get my little lock stitch. So my last machine didn't have that programmed in. So I just took, you know, four or five stitches in very close succession. Same um, principle applies. We're still on basting stitch. Now we're back on manual. Here we go. And just to encourage you, you know, my aim with these waves is to bump into the one before to just brush up against it. They are not perfect by any means. There are lots that either have, you know, a 16th or an 8th inch gap, or I go over a few stitches. So perfection is not the goal. I'm aiming to keep them fairly consistent as to size and spacing. And the eye will read that as pretty dang consistent quilting. We're out of bobbin thread. Look at that. I should have been checking every row. My goal was to know when it was low and to uh, not have it happen in the middle of a row. So it is still telling me that I have 15%. So that must have to do with my breaks, right? There's someone upstairs trying to put a quilt inside the door and it's locked. I told her it would be open and I forgot. So if you run, there's my seam ripper. So since I did run out in the middle, that is certainly not critical. It would have been easier to do at the edge, but I'll do what I've been doing these last few times, which is undo to a seam. And in this case, I'm gonna go just a little bit further and here's why. Because I ran my bobbin right out, those last few inches of bobbin thread do not have good tension on them, right? There's nothing gripping them. So I like to undo at least two or three inches when I run my bobbin out like that. 
That took me past a seam allowance, so I'm just going to the next one. No biggie. And I really am sorry our close-up cam is not working today. It is just, it has just been a day. I wonder if it's an ice cream day. So I'm just dropping my seam ripper. You probably can't see that. Yes, you can't see my fancy blue seam ripper. I just drop that right where my splice is so I can find it when I come back. Sometimes when you're on print fabrics and you don't mark the spot, it can be really hard to find. I've already got another bobbin wound. I'm just going to, because it's been that sort of day, I'm just going to run my bobbin through my toe gauge again, just to be sure that I've got good bobbin tension. I'm kind of glad I did, because I feel like it's a little bit high. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not really showing you guys what I'm doing. I could do that. Where's my wee screwdriver? So I've got, can you see me now? There we go. I've got a Toa gauge in my hand, which is just an extra level of, gosh, lost the thread. <laughs> Checking of tension. And you basically load your bobbin in it, much like you'd load it in a machine. And there's a little pulley system that you wrap around and you get a, a gauge, a reading of the tension that's on that thread as you're pulling it. And kind of an extra feature of this, because a lot of quilters, myself included for years, just do the, you know, the dangling of the bobbin in your hand, and that enables you to judge the tension of the bobbin. But something the Toa gauge does that I love is also allows you to see that it is feeding smoothly. So remember I was telling you earlier that I had my bobbins a bit overloaded and it was producing almost resistance there? That made it, that made it wobble in my reading, right? So I could see my needle kind of going wong, 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 wong that's when I knew there was a problem. So that's why I'm checking it now because things seem to be going wrong so badly today. I thought, you know, I'll just double check that before I put it in. And it seems to be real good. Okay, where were we? When we were so rudely interrupted. I'm just going to get my thread back in place and then I'll take a couple questions and get another sip. My whistle is very dry today. Wet my whistle. Okay, let's go. Questions. Which camera? There we are. Haha. -ha. Christine, have you played with the. Oh, we had that one already. Double needles are couching. Jeanette, do you find it easy to quilt a diagonal line on your Bernina? Well, Jeanette, I don't ever try to quilt a, a perfectly straight diagonal line, like for cross hatching, for example. I don't know of a long arm that you can do that perfectly on because your wheels are vertical and horizontal. So you're always pushing a bit against that. Do you know what I mean? So I always use a ruler when I want a straight diagonal line. When I'm doing something like these waves that have diagonal areas incorporated, easy peasy. But but so was my other machine. That was not an issue. Bennett, I'm watching you as you quilt and notice your neck and head hunched down for long periods of time. Do you regularly get a massage or how do you handle that stress on your body? Great question, Bennett. Um, it's something that I'm trying to learn. One of my friends recently said that to me. She's like, I'm, I'm really praying for you because I see you doing that, you know, hunched over look. So I'm trying to stay more upright as I'm quilting because I don't have to hunch over like that. I just get concentrating. Um, and I, and I deliberately try to relax when I'm not on camera. I also take pretty frequent breaks that I literally do some arm swirls and some neck rolls and just loosen things up. I mean, every probably 15 minutes. So I try and not stay tight that way. I do not regularly get massages. I probably could benefit from them, but I don't. Christine, did you reset the bobbin? No, I didn't, Christine. I ran it a second time and it seemed to be okay. But thank you for asking because I did say that it's running a little bit tight. And the second time I ran it through, I thought that it was fine. And I'll watch my stitching closely when I, you know, launch into it. 
Um, but Madge, the accuracy of the Bernina to tell you the 15% left depends to some extent on the weight and brand of thread. It does, Madge, and that's why I have to tweak a little bit to determine how much I'm getting loaded on a bobbin, right? Because you're right, that absolutely depends on the, the weight of thread that you're using will make a vast difference in how many yards are in fact on your bobbin. Zarina, do you offer payment plans for the classes? Yes, Zarina, there is a three equal monthly payment option for it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you're talking the master class, right? Mr. Producer's asking me, do you mean the big class or the monthly advanced membership? The monthly advanced membership is, I believe it's $19.97 a month. And the master class has the three equal payments if you choose to do that. And Cindy was asking, and I missed Cindy's, I'm sorry. Okay, Annette, she means, did you tell the machine you have a full bobbin? Oh, now I got it. See, you guys are so good for me. Now I did. Thank you for that. Cindy, what speed are you stitching in manual mode? I have it at 1400 at the moment. And the machine max is 2000. I have not gone to 2000. I haven't tried that out. Colette, are you quilting barefooted? Yes, I am. We just got six inches of new snow. I'm jealous of you if you are. Um, you know, yes, I tend to quilt barefoot. And it's funny because I always seem to have cold feet. But I do have a fatigue mat under me. And snow or sun doesn't seem to matter. I just prefer to quilt barefooted. I sew barefooted too. So. Okay. Hike the jeans a little bit and get ready for business. Here we go. And I will be watching the tension. And at the end of this row, I'll stop and feel underneath as well to make sure all is well. Let me make sure my settings are all good. We're not in basting anymore. We're good to go. We're not. <laughs> the day's trials are not over. And I don't know what happened. I did not feel any lurch or jerk, but the bobbin thread is not stitching. Let's have a peek. First thing to do is just re-thread it. It is in fact broken off short. And now I pulled the spring out. You guys, this might be a day when I stop before the quilt is done. get back on the camera. I think it's going to be. I think I'm making an executive decision. So I've just popped the spring out of my bobbin case, which is not an awful thing, but is apt to take me several tries and several starts and stops to fix. And I feel like we've kind of drug on, have we not? I feel like we've drug on the things long enough this morning. Like I'm, I'm willing to try and if it goes first try, great. But if this starts being a process that I have to do and redo, we're going to call it for today. Yeah, no, I'm making an executive decision. This is going to require a magnifying glass and a little bit of fiddling. So in the interest of being real, though, I will tell you what's happening. Every bobbin casing has a spring in the bottom of it. It's very light metal. And it provides a little bit of um, pressure against that bobbin when it's loaded so that the bobbin can't go vroom and unspool, right? It's always under a little bit of um, tension in there. But it's got to be loaded just right. So there's little teeny tiny notches and etc, etc. And my eyes are just not that great anymore, even with the contacts in. So Dave's putting something on the screen for me. Cindy E. No, I'd like to know how to fix that. How do I answer you, Cindy? For, for one thing, there are YouTube videos about it. Your local dealer will be able to help you if you can't get it. I have not yet done this on my Bernina. So I'm going to have to, the trick for me is I'm going to have to get a magnifying glass and some really good light. And that's just not that easy to do on camera. So I'm going to have to go off camera to do it and leave you sitting, which would be awkward. So I'm going to call it for today. We're already at two and a half hours, but I will go ahead and finish this quilt. Um, I'm just thinking on the fly here. If I have time today, I will pop back into YouTube live and show the quilt. So to the lady that was asking, how can we see these after they're done if we're not on Facebook um, or Instagram, I'll try to pop into YouTube live and, and sort of handle the quilt and show you the quilting and show you the end result and prove to you that it is in fact worthwhile going through all of this. But I think for the purposes of this one show, we've pretty much gone on long enough. So I'm gonna work on fixing my spring. I'll let you know how it goes. 
and I will persevere and get this quilt done. <laughs> so let's go our face cam one more time. Thank you all for being so incredibly patient. You know, this is a live and unscripted show and you got to see some really real realness this morning. Um, it's been a process, but we're only just a little bit over the halfway mark. And so I don't want to keep you another hour or more while I finish this quilt. But I thank you so much for tuning in. Remember once again, generally these episodes air the first and third Friday of each month, but in the month of March, 2023, it's going to be the second and third Friday. That will be in my newsletter as we get closer so that you know when they're coming. Um, what else? Remember to tune into the podcast. It comes out weekly on Wednesday mornings. Usually an interview, occasionally just me talking. Podcast.stitchedbysusan.com will take you right to them. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed this, if you learned something from it. I would appreciate that. Um, you know, share it with those that you think would benefit from it as well. So hit that little like button before we go. And again, thank you so very much for joining me and for being gracious and keeping it real. So until next time, see you then. <laughs>